Okay, lecture 19, we'll be covering the aircraft design loads, and we'll continue now covering now about chapter two of the book. Uh, and again, the aircraft design requires uh, developing methods to design, analyze, and manufacture an aircraft while withstanding any experience, stresses, or strains. Shape uh, of the aircraft structure is usually given uh, by the aerodynamic characteristics and typically really using uh, wind tunnel testing to really validate the loads you'll be using in your design. And you wanna choose materials then that will ensure the structural safety while keeping the aircraft light and design or choose the engines. You also have to choose the engines that will meet the, the, the correct thrust requirements. So it takes a, a combination of a multidisciplinary effort, very similar to, to what we discussed to launch vehicles where you need a combination of a team that can achieve the desired goal. And you're usually gonna need the propulsion team, the structures team, the fluid mechanics team, and then the avionics team, all of them working together with the systems engineering in combination with the manufacturing team and the designers. Again, all that is required because if one expertise makes decisions, it will affect other areas of expertise. In the aircraft design, what you're looking for then is you're trying to set the design goals. So for example, do I want my aircraft to be a, uh, a, a small passenger aircraft, or I wanna have a large number of passengers. And then on, in, when you're going through that process, now you're looking at really trying to understand the cost and benefits of short flights versus long flights, how many passengers you wanna have in that aircraft, and you know how many times you wanna fly a day. All that plays a role in coming up with a big picture perspective when it comes to aircraft design. Number two there then, it becomes more about performance. You want to get the best performance because at the end of the day, the, the airliner wants to save money on fuel. And, and you also want to then optimize uh, your, your, your patterns for flight across the, the world. Uh, and you also want to make sure that you have optimized it per passenger, the cost per passenger, because it's really that that's going to give you the profit, really trying to understand that profit margin. And so that, that's why it's not just a structural thing. It's not a proportion thing. It's, it's a combination of factors that's going to help you really understand what is required in that design. Uh, to, the ingredients are, uh, is, is what you want to have there. And so here's an example of uh, different requirements you're going to have. Here I have a 400 passenger aircraft that I want to design for, a 40 year service life, in an all weather condition aircraft, meaning I can land this beast, I can land it in Alaska, I can land it in the Death Valley. You know, this aircraft then has to then be designed to weather conditions that could be significant. Uh, all weather also means, and we talked about that before, but you want an aircraft to be able to pass water ingestion, ingestion tests. You want this aircraft to survive uh, a number of conditions that may be not necessary for other type of aircraft that you, you may design. It needs to be maintainable, reliable, and damage tolerant. Then, then you may have another type of aircraft. It could be a military flight, flight uh, fighter attack system. Uh, but then there you're looking for speed or uh, with, with very low noise reduction at a very high Mach number. Um, with maybe a load factor, I'll be discussing load factors today, a seven and a half Gs, for example. Or you have a, a, a unmanned uh, vehicle, aerial vehicle there, that's a long range. Whatever it is, those requirements need to be put in place first. So then you, then, so you can then design an aircraft that can meet the requirements that we covered in the previous lecture, the, the federal aviation requirements, regulations, and whatever meal handbook specs you need to meet, those criteria need to be designed, but you have to design against those criteria. And that means I need to really understand the loading environments, the external loading environments, and those external loading environments, I'll be covering that today, will drive then the environments, which are pressure, the fuselage pressure, uh, for example, is one, one loading condition. Uh, and then you also have the inertial loads because every loading condition you have acting on the aircraft 
is getting balanced by the mass times acceleration. Very similarly to we saw what we saw with the launch vehicle, de vehicle design. We saw that there. We saw how the, the mass times acceleration really balance all the load. When you're landing the aircraft then, you can also have external loads from the ground pushing against the landing gear. And we demonstrated how those tests can be quite significantly uh, challenging to perform and they're really stressing those landing gears quite a bit. Then you have the thermal conditions and the acoustic loading is gonna cause vibration environment on the aircraft. And so what I really wanna do is to characterize the external load environment and then determine the internal load paths within the structure because those internal loads, and when I say internal loads, what I really mean here is a free body diagram. We showed you how to do the free body diagram for a beam in mechanics of materials. We showed you how to do the free body diagram for creating section cuts on a launch vehicle design. And you saw how those loads, internal loads were really generated by the external loads acting on the surface of the launch vehicle. I, I, and that was really driven by the angle of attack, the thrust, and then the gimbal uh, loading to balance the fact that you don't want that rocket to start rotating uh, with, uh, with, you know, with no, no purpose, right? And so those internal loads are gonna then help you size the fuselage thickness, the number of stiffeners that you need, and then uh, other elements in the design. Okay, is that clear so far? And so then we want to take that information and then size your analysis. And then once you develop your allowables, we talked about that a lot, uh, your allowables, you're going to perform your testing. And then you want to then compare your analysis to those tests to validate those analyses. They're going to help you size the design finally. And then once you have confidence in that analysis with the margins of safety, factors of safety, specified the A basis or B basis allowable specified, A basis for single load paths, B basis for redundant structures, and then with the highest expected loads, which I'll be discussing today, which is differently, is designed, is specified very differently here compared to the launch vehicle. And launch vehicle designs, you're developing that for a 9990 statistical basis uh, for the loads. In the aircraft design is, is more driven by the federal aviation regulations, which I already covered, but I'll be showing you some of those tables later. And then you take that analysis then and develop the certification reports that are required. So that's what we got there for the kind of the big picture there. And then, and then so here, the final, the, the, the process goes from left to right here. And you have the problem description which typically requires some amount of R&D. You definitely want to keep advancing technology. Perhaps you have a better wing airfoil cross-section or you have a better profile for your fuselage. Maybe the nose design is different because maybe the nose design will reduce drag. Maybe you have a new material system that you came up with and that material system can now help you with, with reducing weight and giving you higher strength. And lithium aluminum is one of such metal that people have been looking at, for example. We have the composite fuselage design could be unique in the sense of maybe I'm using very new fiber systems or metric systems. But that's, that's what we're talking about here when I say R&D, is what can you do to continue to compete? You know, for example, the competitors, for example, would be, for example, you have Boeing, and then you have Airbus, and then you have many other the uh, competitors, Embraer, for example, or the Canadian re regional jets, uh, all these companies are competing against each other. And for you to be for you to be able to survive, you definitely want to invest money on R and D to keep pushing the technology to keep reducing that weight. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I don't see how we can keep improving. But no, you you can continue to improve, and the ways you can continue to improve is perhaps your technology has advanced to the point that you can reduce weight, for, for example. Or maybe you can even drop, I'm not suggesting that we drop the factors of safety, but you've increased your confidence in the, in, in the analysis and the test approaches to the point that you feel that like you can now um, basically do that, okay? 
And then you have the mission requirements I talked about. You know, you want your aircraft to go from here to Europe uh, long distances, or you want to go short distances. And then your constraints and configurations. All that goes into your preliminary design. You have your aircraft requirements, and then you want to make sure that your concept design, initial concept design, preliminary design, will then meet the, those specifications, at least at the first level view. And then you can outline, you know, lay out your product. Uh, that means, you know, the seat spacing, uh, the aisles, uh, you know, how, how space they are between rows uh, and things like that. The pitch, they call it. Uh, and then you go into your design philosophy. And that's your analysis there. You do your detailed component modeling, your validation. And if it's not safe based on the analysis you've done, you have to kind of redesign and then go into assembly modeling. Once you have this going through uh, the critical design review and you've gone through some amount of testing um, from the building block approach we discussed earlier, then you can take that information and you can now plug it into your manufacturing. And the idea then there is, is to then manufacture your components and hope that your manufacturing, after I go through the test program, that that testing is, is looking good. Because if you're satisfied, you're ready to manufacture for aircraft delivery. But if you're not satisfied, you need to start looking at a design cycle that can sometimes be significant. And it's going to take you from manufacturing to analysis uh, in, 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 you know, several times until you get it right. Uh, and so uh, moving along here, uh, we have the sources of loads that we want to discuss. And the sources of loads can come from static, dynamic, weight analyses. And then you have the preliminary design of the air, airframe stresses. Uh, that's going to, uh, you're going to have to consider additional sources of loads when you do that preliminary design. The airplane wing body junction, that, that location where the wing connects with the fuselage, is actually one of the areas that's very challenging. And we've already discussed some of that, but just want to point out. Uh, detailed internal loads are very important. Crack growth and residual strength analyses, nonlinear geometry. And you have to account for the proportion structure interaction potentially, the structure acoustic interaction, and the potential for bird impacts onto the engines. And then uh, you want to definitely want to uh, prepare yourselves and you want to make sure your aircraft uh, has uh, a good good design philosophies when it comes to air, air worthiness, um, crash worthiness. Um, we want to make sure it's good for crash worthiness uh, requirements. And so the, the, the sources of loads, the certifications and conditions are typically provided in the CFR 14, part 25 and part 25, FAR, uh, those regulations. The commercial here, when you see C, that means subpart C, that means commercial. That structures and the middle handbook 8860 8870 provide the additional recommendations for military applications. But here's the, the, the loads how you can break them up. And I'll group, I like to group them into three um, groups one is flight loads, one is ground loads, and the other one is other loads and conditions. For flight loads, you're looking at maneuver, gust, control deflection, buffet, inertia, and for vibration. And then for ground loads, you're looking at vertical load factor, the braking, the turns when you're turning an aircraft, you can put a lot of load, catapult, arrested landing, aborted takeoff. By the way, I experienced an aborted takeoff. It was not fun. It was an LAX. Spin up, spring back, and I'll be covering the one wheel and two wheel landing coming up, towing, ground winds, and breakaway. And then you have these other loads that need to really be considered that can be extreme. You have jacking, pressurization is not extreme, is, 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 is going to be common, crash, actuation, bird strike, and bird strike, what you want to do there is do a lot of testing to see if your structure can survive those conditions. Uh, lightning strike, hail, power plant, thermal fatigue, damage tolerance, fail safety, and acoustics, okay? So uh, a collection, uh, so, so how does this work? It does require teamwork because you're gonna have a collection of separate models. 
uh, it, will, it will contain major structural details and it's gonna require cooperative effort, internal loads, external loads, and, a, and it's gonna involve stress groups. And there's a lot of demands here. You're gonna have a lot of, you're gonna have at least a hundred load cases, a lot of scenarios, engine out, uh, landing, uh, pull up maneuver, uh, and so pull down maneuver, bank. Uh, so a lot of different load cases need to be looked at and many groups have to use those results. So you're looking at a major uh, organization required to really be able to keep yourself in the program schedule that's required. The extreme conditions I was talking about, that you need to be prepared for, and for which testing is actually required and cover lightning in the federal aviation regulations already. But you have the uncontained engine failure, so you can have a blade that that basically goes flying and hits the fuselage. Uh, you want to make sure that the fuselage can survive those conditions. Engine windmilling, flight hail, and then ballistic damage. Uh, types of loads and sources, again, we're looking at ultimate and fatigue. You're going to have the floor and frame. For example, there you, you have in the floor and, frame, fr floor and frame, you have people walking. You have the seats, you have the galleys, you have the cargo. And then on top of that, you have to add the G loads. The, the, because when you're flying a cruising altitude and everything's great, you know, no turbulence, nothing, that's 1G. That's your load factor. When a lift equals weight, that's your load factor is 1G. But in reality, in reality, uh, you're gonna have a situation where uh, you may have uh, extreme loading conditions. And that can happen, say for example, the aircraft has to descend very dramatically down from 35,000 feet down to 15,000 feet. Well you're gonna feel a lot, feel a lot of G-loading. Well, that, that, that flooring needs to be designed with beams that can take those loads, including the G-loads. And when I talk about ultimate fatigue, I'm really talking about including flat maneuvers, gust, ground maneuvers, and landing. The pressure loads also fluctuate. Every time you take off and land, you have one pressure cycle. And the loads do provide a lot of uh, stress onto the fuselage skin. Uh, due to the cabin pressure. And then you also have to design for sudden decompression because you don't want the whole fuselage to basically collapse due to this sudden decompression. So it's very important. Those stiffeners around the aircraft are really providing that shape so things don't collapse on, it, on itself. Uh, you also need to make sure that you can survive tire burst pressure. So if, the, if one of the tires blows up, uh, or we have a burst of the fuel slosh center section that you can still land successfully uh, with no issues. Load carrying doors, uh, you're gonna have, we talked about that before, uh, main landing gear, and then you have the fail safe conditions we talked about. And we also talked about a little bit about the structural considerations, and this is more of a reminder, you need to design to meet certain conditions. So you have the external loads, you have the debility and damage tolerance, you have the crash, and then you have the failed refueling valve, and then the hail and bird strike, lightning strike and material utilization. So these are the considerations that you need to take into account. And a lot of this needs to be taken into account in relationship with what your design looks like. For example, you have a rear spar here, you have the logo lights, you have the auxiliary front spar, you have the leading edge. And all those components here need to be mapped against the failure modes of concern, like bird strike, crash, uh, lightning damage, and so forth. I already covered a lot of this. Uh, so again, it's just a reminder uh, because it's been a while since I last covered it. And then here is what those affects what. Uh, we talked about the aileron uh, causing the roll. You have the negative gust, uh, and I'll be co covering gust today. You have your engine blade out. Uh, you have the cabin pressure, your gust also affects the, the, this front section here. You have your, the rudder kick, the yaw maneuver, and the lateral gust will be a problem. And in fact, that's one of the things that may have brought the American Airlines aircraft down when the tail broke, for which Dr. Raju and his team performed a significant, uh, he was part of the failure investigation to help resolve it. Uh, buffet loading, and then you have your negative and positive maneuvers. All that needs to be accounted for in your designs, and I'll be covering some of that today. 
just a reminder, what are the inputs? Uh, the, so you, you have your inputs here. The spoilers here are changing the lift, drag, and roll. Um, and the wing here will generate the wing. It, sorry, the, the wing generates a lift. And the spoilers, by increasing and deploying the flaps, I can now increase lift at lower altitudes. Because when you go to lower altitudes, you have to go sm slower. And if I go slower, I have smaller lift for the same wing area. So I really need to increase that wing area. And to do that, you can e either use morphing technologies or just uh, deploy your flaps to be able to account for that. The aileron will change, will provide that roll that you need. The jet engine provides a thrust. And then you have your horizontal stabilizers that provide the control pitch and the elevator as well, up and down. And then rudder provides the side, the yawing, right? And so then these are your controls. And all of that is providing loading into the structure. Now, the good news is in a major, in a major aerospace organization, uh, they're going to have experts in the loads arena, in the fluid mechanics arena. So you're going to know exactly what conditions to design for. You're going to know what conditions to design for, uh, and you'll be able to tell, OK, well, these are the loads I need to apply to this rudder. Um, these are the loads I need to apply to this horizontal stabilizer and, and so forth. And then you can then use the free body diagram approach to then go in and design that. I'll be covering that in the next lecture that will be posted in a couple of days, uh, how to do that in a deeper level, um, top level view, but deeper level enough that covers equations in the book. Uh, here is an example of what people typically use uh, in the designs. We like to have aircraft stations because typically aircraft design is not, the analysis is not done by a single person. Typically is the, the responsibilities for the analyses are typically distributed across uh, multiple people. That's how it, it typically will work. Uh, and, and, is, and, and so therefore, you need to have the stations defined so you can tell people what they're responsible for. It also helps you with plotting free body diagrams. And everybody knows, well, OK, the highest stress is about this point. Well, that's about 500. Uh, I forget the units here, but it's about 500 away from uh, the, the tip. So that, that's where that becomes important um, in the design. Let me take a break, if that's OK, uh, and we'll continue. Thank you. And so you can idealize a wing box. Typically, a wing box is going to be comprised, for example, this is a, a wing box here. And this, this will be a part of your um, design to, to make sure that the wing can take the loading conditions that we'll experience. And typically, you're going to create a free body diagram of that wing. And those free body diagram of that wing will give you shear moment. And that's what you're going to then use to analyze <clears throat> this uh, cross section. The actual skin and the webs typically carry the axial and shear stresses. And in some designs, what you will do, in some analysis, what you will do, you will simplify the design. And that's covered in my book quite a bit. You'll simplify this. And there's even an example on how to do it. You'll then take this design and simplify it. And then here, these, these, these uh, locations take only actual stresses. So I'm basically simplifying the model a little bit more. And then here, the walls take the shear stresses only. So that's typically the way you approach it. Here you can see a uh, wing idealization. This is straight uh, from one of the books. And you can see, you know, the design looks very complicated. Semi-monocoque or monocoque construction. Typically, the design will look complex, but you can idealize it in a way that where these booms can take the tension or compression loads and then the skin takes the shear load and you can quickly calculate what the stresses are in the skin versus the 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 booms for the, for the fuselage very similarly you're going to have the fuselage uh, with the stiffeners in them the stiffeners are not are missing here but the wall will carry the axial and shear stresses and what the modeling simplification 
is typically that you will go ahead and model it with booms again. And these, these booms are taking just tension and compression while this can only take shear stress. That's typically the approach. And then on top of that, on top of that, not only you have the skin stress uh, from shear, then you have the fuselage pressurization of the delta P across the fuselage because as you ascend, right, the internal pressure, the cabin's pressurized to 78 PSI. So you have a pressure differential across a wall uh, that causes the, the, the fuselage to expand. So when you combine that with the shear stresses from the section loads, uh, those need to be considered in the analysis. Here's an example in my book, and it, it, it shows an I-beam cross-section, and the I-beam cross-section in the figure 2.14 of the book has been simplified so that it only has uh, two booms uh, and then this section here. And what you're trying to do really is to come up with an equivalent model that gives you the same response as the actual cross-section. You can see here that with the modeling simplification, if you follow this, I don't wanna cover this in extensive detail because you know how to calculate the inertia of an I-beam. All this should be fairly simple. And to calculate it using the approach that I'm showing here, this idealization is not very difficult. Just come up with an equivalent area that should go here to give you the closest answer as the inertia here. And, and you can see here that you get really close, 60.5 versus 60.67, 83.33 versus 83.33. So the inertia calculated with this method versus the ideal cross-section method, it gives you very similar answers. And these are the basic dynamics, uh, just showing you more the, 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 the corresponding displacements and those. You have yaw, that goes with yaw moment. You have vertical deflation that goes with lift. You have drag that goes with the longitudinal direction. You have theta that goes with the rolling moment. And then you have um, the rolling moment goes with the roll uh, here theta, and then the pitch theta goes with the pitching moment. And then you have the yawning moment already covered. So those typically, that's what you're gonna see in different books. And you're gonna have a coefficient of lift, a coefficient of drag, and then sometimes you have coefficients of moments as well. And those are really all calculated uh, and, and they're calculated through wind tunnel test data. So more or less on, 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 on Aircraft, the engine torque creates torsion. As you get, uh, when you have these uh, engines uh, uh, operating, you'll get some amount of torsional stress. And then when you have an aircraft, say that you have a pull-up maneuver, in those situations, you have compression at the top and tension on the bottom. So you get bending loading across a vehicle. And again, you can characterize that through a, a free body diagram which you'll be doing as part of the homework. Here's an example of the loads, and it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice to see everything together. So here, side view is very nice. You have the drag, the weight, the thrust, the moment, the lift, and the balance load. So that's a side view. Top view, you're gonna have other loads as well. I'll show you later. But you can see very quickly here that if I know the lift, the drag, the thrust, the weight, the moment, and balance load, I can just do section cut. Just treat this thing as a beam, cut it, and then do a free body diagram and get the section moment and the section shear. Using those two things as a function of location across the aircraft, you can now determine and size the cross section. Okay, that's a typical procedure for sizing an aircraft by hand. Then you'll go to find elements to confirm that what you're doing is, is accurate. Okay, so that, that's the general process here. So, so yeah, that, the static load balance will help you understand what is going on with the load paths and how the moments, bending moment and shear distributions are distributed. Very important stuff. Then here you have your lift and drag. This is drag coefficient and this is lift coefficient. These quantities can be determined from testing. And here you have uh, D as a drag force, L is a lift force. 
Here, S is the wingspan area. V infinity here is the airspeed. And I, I'll go, I'll talk about that later. And then rho infinity is the air density. And so these this quantities correspond to, uh, is going to help you determine. So typically you calculate CD and CL from wind tunnel testing. And given the density, given the speed of the, of the aircraft and this wingspan area, then you can get D, the drag. And the same way here on the right hand side, you can get the lift. You can see that is, is, you will get this lift and then this drag. And then the thrust is balanced in the drag, of course. So very clearly, uh, these quantities can be fully found because you know at a given point, what is the air density? At a given point, you know the wingspan area doesn't change, although it does change as you're landing. So you have to consider that loading condition as a separate one. And then the, you have the air speed, which is known as a function of time. And then the drag coefficient, lift coefficient are typically calculated from wind tunnel testing. Uh, one of the important aspects that are discussed extensively in my book is the idea of the aerodynamic center. The aerodynamic center is, location, is a location where the aerodynamic forces is applied, and that helps because it eliminates the problem of a moving center of pressure with angle of attack in an aerodynamic analysis. What happens is when you change the angle of attack, uh, you, you move, you're gonna have movement of that center of pressure. Uh, on that wing. And so what the aerodynamic center is doing is trying to keep that uh, at a particular location. So to ease the design problems, we typically prefer characterizing the forces on an airfoil by the aerodynamic force, coupled with the aerodynamic moment to account for that torque. The aerodynamic center then is, is a location where we place those aerodynamic loads. That's where we're gonna place them for structure analysis. And that way we eliminate the issue of the movement of the center of pressure. So in other words, the aerodynamic center is a, is a fixed point. Typically for each air, airfoil, uh, in respect of which the moment coefficient remains constant uh, when the angle of attack changes. In other words, that aerodynamic center is a fixed point and is irrespective of what is going on with the angle of attack. From the literature, and this is just from the literature and experimental and analysis. Typically, the aerodynamic force is typically applied at, loca at a location one fourth quarter back from the leading edge uh, of most low speed airfoils. The magnitude of the aerodynamic moment remains nearly constant with respect to the angle of attack, which is why that's so awesome to have that, that location defined. For supersonic airfoils, you will find that the aerodynamic center is more closer to a half. But for low speed airfoils, you're looking more at a quarter cord back from the leading edge. Uh, and that's discussed extensively, extensively in the book and even shows you a way of calculating that. In fact, that's a formula here, if you're trying to find how to calculate it. You wanna keep that uh, aerodynamic coefficient uh, constant, uh, the moment constant. And so to do that, you take this derivative set equal to zero and that tells you exactly where that needs to be. So you can actually can do it analytically as well. So one of the important, one of the most important aspects of designing an aircraft is really, we're really here talking about the load factor. The load factor is a lift divided, divided by wing, um, sorry, lift divided by weight. Um, give me a minute. And so then we have uh, that the lift equals the load factor times the weight, which is one half rho v squared s. And then you have the lift coefficient, which is the maximum value you could have. And so that'll give you the maximum lift you can ever have. Um, the positive load factor, uh, during normal flight, the load factor is one G or greater than one G. Whenever the load factor is one or greater, the load factor is defined as positive. A negative load factor now corresponds to that under certain conditions, an abrupt deviation from aircraft's equilibrium can cause an inertial acceleration that in turn will cause a weight to become greater than lift. So you can have a situation where weight is greater than lift. And when that happens, then that will happen during a stall, the load factor will reduce to zero because you, you get basically zero lift. And at that point, the pilot, everybody will feel weightless 
And so that's why in that case, you have a negative load factor. A sudden and forceful elevator control movement can also cause a load factor to move into that negative region. L acts perpendicular to a flight path. And you can see here the, the, the vehicle here moving uh, to the left. And so that's, that lift is perpendicular to a, a flight path. D acts parallel to the forward velocity vector. And it tends to be parallel to the, to the flight path. Weight acts vertically down. So you can see here an example, the aircraft is, is um, inclined. And so W always acts downward. And T is generally inclined at an angle to the flight path. So you can then write the equations uh, for this particular situation. And you can calculate uh, summation of forces equals MA, which is M times the velocity dot equals the thrust minus the drag minus W sine theta. And so that'll give you the velocity that will give you the equation of motion along uh, the thrust vector here. So that's T minus D. And then this W can be decomposed. Uh, so it goes along the D direction, the drag direction, and that's W sine theta. Then you can write also the, the equation uh, perpendicular to the flight path. And you can do that very quickly. And you get L minus W cosine theta. That's in that direction. And then you have mv times theta dot, or the rotation of that uh, aircraft. Uh, so v times d theta dot gives you an acceleration as well. And you can see here that uh, I get mv squared divided by r, which is the same thing as mv theta dot. So this is the question I get uh, for this particular situation. If I have a gliding path, the flight configuration there means that there's no thrust. So in this equation, thrust is zero. Steady state flight means that the flight configuration where the forces and moments do not vary in time, neither in magnitude nor direction. So if it's level flight and it's steady flight, then T minus D is zero and L minus W is zero. In this case, you can see that that works out uh, because the left hand side is zero. So therefore, and then theta is also zero. So this is one, this is zero. And so therefore, T, the thrust equals the drag, the lift equals the weight. And if the lift equals the weight, then if you're a passenger in an aircraft, you feel a load factor of one because you feel your own weight, one G. And again, L is one half rho V infinity squared or the airspeed. And then S is a span area of the wing. And CL is a coefficient of lift that can be found through uh, wind tunnel testing and depends on the angle of attack. Here, the angle of attack is zero. I'll show you later how CL varies as a function of alpha. Straight flight, the flight configuration where the center of gravity of the aircraft travels along the straight line. And then you also have the idea of the symmetric flight, flight configuration where both the angle of slight slip, uh, and which is the angle between the direction of motion and the longitudinal axis of the airplane is zero. And the plane of symmetry of the airplane is perpendicular to the plane of the Earth. So that's what symmetric flight means. And then you have, again, straight flight, steady flight, and gliding flight. Very important concepts to keep in mind as we move forward here. So let's look at the equations for a level turn up, uh, pull up. So here you can see that the lift and the weight um, are pointed towards O. And the velocity here is V. And if you were to calculate the centripetal acceleration, uh, you will find that the lift is related to the weight through this equation, V squared divided by GR plus cosine theta. And you can then also calculate N, uh, which will be L over W. And then you can see here that the greater the velocity, the greater the load factor. Uh, or the smaller the radius, they'll also increase the load factor. G is a constant, the acceleration constant here. Then you can consider a bank turn. So in this case, a bank turn looks like this. Uh, you can see that the aircraft is, is rolling. That's your bank alpha phi. 
The weight always points downwards, so that's easy. And then you're also going to have a centripetal force, uh, mv squared divided by r. And then you have the lift, again, uh, is dolly divided by cosine t. And so you can calculate from here uh, the load factor for this situation. W equals L cosine phi, and then FC is a centripetal acceleration or force. is mv squared divided by R, and that's equal to L sine phi. And you can see here that now I can then calculate L over W. And when I do that calculation, I get the square root of V to the fourth divided by G squared times R squared all that plus one. Square root of that, that gives you a load factor for this problem. So the VN diagram, the VN diagram, and, and, and one more thing, so th this load factor will become important for the next discussion. And just for pull up, you can also calculate for pull down, and that's in the book, you can look at it there, uh, but the load factor will become important coming up. Uh, this illustrates the optimal, the VN diagram illustrates the optimal flight conditions while providing the aerodynamic and structural limitations for the aircraft. It's also called the VN diagram, the maneuver diagram, and it's a plot of the load factor versus the flight velocity. So that's what the VN diagram is. Uh, it, it allows you to come up with a flat envelope. And that flat envelope is important in driving the design. It's actually one of the most important plots in the design process. The FAA or JAA regulations specify the limit load factors, which depend on the type of aircraft. It could be transport, aerobatic, military, and at load speeds, the aircraft maximum lift coefficient constrains the maximum load factor. We'll be discussing that coming up. But again, the VN diagram really is the envelope, and that drives a lot of the design um, that that goes uh, that needs to be done. So here, I want to point out some important aspects. So uh, here you can see there is the dynamic pressure. The dynamic pressure is one half the air density uh, times the air speed, uh, but uh, all air speeds on the diagram are equivalent air speeds. And so, so when you create a VN diagram, they're all equivalent air speeds. So I had to find a way of transforming that to that. For flight in incompressible air, the dynamic pressure is Q equals one half, the density of air, the air speed at the altitude of concern squared. So we have to define an air speed so that everything can be equivalent and that's typically done at sea level. So the way you're gonna do that, you're gonna calculate uh, an equivalent air speed. To accomplish that, to do that, uh, you have equivalent, equivalent air speed equals the air speed uh, at that altitude, square root of the density at that altitude divided by the density at sea level. So you're really referencing back to sea level and that's how the velocity is calculated. In order to cover all altitudes, we always want to use the velocity at sea level on the VN diagrams. Okay? And we call that the equivalent airspeed is what I, I, what I should say. From this point forward, all airspeeds now, I won't use the VEAS. Uh, we're going to just call it V, so it's much easier to, to deal with that. Now, this is the VN diagram. Um, and the VN diagram uh, is quite busy here. Let's focus here on the right first. And you can see for civil and commercial aircraft, uh, you have category aircraft. You have US transports, uh, less than 3740 pounds. You have US transports greater than 48,500 pounds. You have utility, aerobatic, home builds, transports, strategic bombers, tactile bombers, and fighters. And then in the next column, what you have there is, is the maximum load factor. And that's a maximum load factor, really, is really a maximum load factor that's been specified. And then you have the minimum load factor. So the load factor here, you can see that for US transport is 3.8. What does that mean? Let's go back to the definition of load factor. So here, 
uh, lift divided by weight, the maximum value I can have is 3.8. That's what it, that's what this is telling us that n max is. And, and then we also have, we also have the US transport above 48,500 pounds is 2.5 n max, but the, the negative load factor is 1.0. So these, you can see here, the fighter jets will, can achieve a higher load factor. And so they're designed more aggressively to meet that. So when I look, this, this is very important information. This drives your design. So I go here towards the left and I study what is going on. Let's take it step by step. From, you can see here, there's a curve here, right? And where you see this color here, this peach color, A, B, the region A, B, and then a line drawn downward C, E, D, all this area here, I call it the aerodynamic structural safety. I'm safe in this space, okay? And then the next thing I wanna point out, let's go all the way to the right. So when I go beyond this straight line downwards, and let me use a uh, laser pointer here. Uh, when I go past this straight line to the right, I start to enter the calcium region. And what I mean there is, I'm gonna come into something called the dive speed. And it's this dive speed, you could have a flutter, a condition called flutter. Uh, that velocity, we wanna stay away from that. There's a particular test that's done to, 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 to really show that we're okay there. Past this point, we are at the proportion limit. So clearly we're gonna be not here. It will be very hard to get here because of the proportion limit itself. So you really constrain from VD and less. And we wanna really keep it at the maximum level flight crew speed. And if you went above that, that's a calcium region uh, and you could in start entering flutter when you hit the dive speed. So that, that's where we are. So now let's look at what is going on here. This curve here, curve here, A, B, H. This curve here, if I'm less than this curve, and I'm in this pink region, I call that the aerodynamic failure region. So I could be stalling, right? So that's what that means. This, this pink area here is called aerodynamic failure region, and I will have an inverted stall in this region. So I wanna stay away from here and here. I wanna be in, in this, bucket here and then i have the n max n max points b to this point here are protecting protecting us against structural damage that's what that is and then here i also want to protect against structural damage in the inverted configuration with negative load factors so again this is where i want to be uh, and this is where I wanna be, okay? And I wanna keep within this zone here. That's that's what we wanna do. We wanna keep away from structural failure in the gray, aerodynamic failure in this region, and then we don't wanna enter into the calcium region. We wanna stay in this area. And, and notice how, and I apologize if it was not clear, the y-axis is a load factor, and the x-axis here is the velocity of the aircraft. Again, the VN diagram, drives a lot of the analysis that needs to be done. Here you can see what the lift coefficient is. The lift coefficient is the y-axis. In the x-axis, we have the angle of attack. And you can see here a zero angle of attack, you have a particular lift coefficient. And again, what you wanna do is you wanna use this information. You can see here how n max is equal to the maximum lift coefficient I can have, right? That's the end, so the, how, what is the highest load factor I can have? The highest load factor I can have is one that gives me uh, the maximum lift coefficient. So that's that point here, okay? And that means I'll be at a higher angle of attack. So I'll be pushing the load factor quite strongly there. And then times a row divided by two, dolly divided by S, and this is the velocity air speed equivalent airspeed as we discussed before, which uh, has been done by referencing to the sea level density. And then very similarly, I can calculate the minimum load factor. And that minimum load factor is driven by here. You can see here I have an inverted stall. And so that coefficient of lift can also be calculated. 
And so with that information, you can determine N max and N min. And you can plot that very simply because you know the weight of the aircraft, you know the wingspan area, you know the density, and then you know V, the airspeed. And you can see here, I can now uh, calculate N max and I can calculate N min. for point B and for point D. So let's look at the stall region first very carefully. First, the curve between points A and B. So the points between points A and B here um, represents the aerodynamic limit on load factor imposed by CL max. So CL max here was calculated to be this. I showed it in this slide. And I put a comma A to indicate aerodynamic failure. So one half rho CO max W over S V squared, where WS is the wing loading, is a characteristic of different aircraft. So this will be always different for different aircraft. Rho here is the sea level density of air. Remember, we, we try to reference everything back to sea level and V is equivalent airspeed. The region above curve AB in the VN diagram is the aerodynamic stall region. In this stall region, the aircraft will not fly because it will cause aerodynamic failure. Failure, I mean, if you try, then you're gonna fail aerodynamically. So that's what that curve, that's how you construct that curve right here. In the book, we go through several examples on how to construct this very carefully. The operational limit, uh, which is a horizontal line BG, denotes the positive li limit load factor in the VN diagram. Beyond this line, the aircraft undergoes structural damage. Let me look at that with you carefully. So that's line BG here. Okay, that line BG, and I should draw from here to here, I apologize, from here to here. If I'm above that line, then that I'm above that load factor, the aircraft will undergo structural damage. Maneuver speed, the flight velocity corresponding to point B is the maneuver speed. And I'm gonna denote as V star. So let me look at the flight velocity here. That's the velocity V star we're talking about at that point in time. And at velocities higher than V star, say VB, the aircraft must fly at values that are lower than the maximum lift coefficient to avoid exceeding the positive limit load factor. The maneuvering speed is the lowest speed at which the aircraft can attain the prescribed maximum limit normal maneuver factor and max. And it is the intersection of the stall boundary and the operational limit boundary. So I showed you that. The point B on the VN diagram is very important and we call it the maneuver point. And I said that several times. At this point, both the coefficient lift and the load factor, both of these are simultaneously at the highest possible values anywhere throughout the flight envelope of the aircraft. During turns, this point simultaneously corresponds to the smallest possible instantaneous turn radius. So if I'm turning, and that's gonna to correspond to the smallest possible turn radius and the largest possible turn rate for the aircraft. So we call the velocity corresponding to point B as the corner velocity, corner velocity, or maneuver velocity, and we can define it as such. So I can define it as such, okay? So, so there you go, that's, that's how you calculate that. Uh, and, and here, again, the maneuver speed, we're talking about that point here. And proportion limit, we already covered the proportion limit. That's this line I from I to like this, this line right here, right? And that line is a, speed, is a speed limit. At velocity is higher than the speed limit, the dynamic pressure is higher than the design for the aircraft. So that will not really, that's gonna cause flutter, uh, aileron the reversal, wing divergence and buffeting, which will lead to a failure and disintegration. So, the high speed lim limit velocity, we call that the red line speed for the aircraft and the pilot should never exceed that. The speed limit there is the diving speed. So designing for diving speed, typically the diving speed for a normal aircraft is about 1.4 times the crew, 
cruising speed. I'm so, I apologize. And the diving speed limit is by design higher than the level flight cruise velocity V max, usually by at least a factor 1.3, but typically for a normal aircraft 1.4. It, it may be as high as the dive, terminal dive velocity of the aircraft. Uh, in the case of civil aircraft, VD, the dive velocity determines whether the design of the aircraft allows to operate into the transonic range or not. This speed, this dive speed, is a red line speed for the aircraft. We should never exceed that, never. FAR 23 recommend these values, as I said. And for aircraft flying at relatively low speeds, subsonic region, you can set the dive speed to be one and a half, 1.25, the cruising velocity. And this value comes from the required design operational characteristics. And then now the bottom part of the VN diagram is given by the curve AF. Let me show you the curve here. Uh, so the curve A, we want to talk about this curve here. And the horizontal line, this horizontal line, so this should be this line, this should be F here. So that that curve right here, AF and FE, uh, that, that's your safe zone there. And it corresponds to absolute negative angles of attack. That means you have negative lift, hence the load factors are negative quantities. An inverted stall region, where the curve AF defines the inverted stall limit, if the wing is pitched downward to a large enough negative angle of attack, the flow will separate from the bottom surface of the wing and then you will get a negative lift and the wing could stall. The operational limit, the horizontal line, uh, if uh, is DE in the, in the plot, gives the negative limit load factor beyond you can have structural damage. So this should be FE, this should be F not D and that's why that's getting confusing. And the ultimate structural limits, uh, the lines HI and JK, represent the ultimate load factors beyond which structural failure will occur. So that's these lines here, HI and IJ. Beyond this, you're gonna have structural failure. Here in between, you could have some amount of structural damage. So very important consideration uh, as you're moving forward, that's gonna drive your design. That's gonna drive how, you, you know, how, how, what the design looks like. When you put the flaps down, and when you put the flats up, it's gonna change uh, the behavior during landing and takeoff. So very important consideration, during landing and takeoff, you're gonna have different values. And so you could have a different VN diagram because of the influence of, of the landing and takeoff uh, on the load factor. So that's gonna change this, this VN diagram behavior. A positive angle of attack means you're over here in the top at positive, positive load factors. And then you have a negative high angle of attack if you're down here. And you can see here, high angle of attack, low angle of attack. So high angle of attack, low angle of attack. The higher the velocity, the lower angle of attack. It forces you to have a lower angle of attack um, if you're going to a higher velocity. Because then you need a lower lift coefficient, that's why. And then here, I can be a higher angle of attack if I wanna maintain uh, that particular load factor. Uh, and then the, the, the very similarly negative high angle of attack, if I'm at very low velocities and I wanna keep the same load factor. Uh, again, angle of attack really increases uh, the load factor. And, and, and so that's why that's important to understand it, what's going on here. And so you can see here on the wing cross section, what is going on. If I drew a quadrant just about like that, the top left quadrant, you're gonna have a compression behavior at a high angle of attack, tension behavior in a low angle of attack. And then here at the bottom, you can see bottom left quadrant is a compression high angle of attack tension low angle of attack. On the top right, you can see compression low angle of attack, tension high angle of attack. On the bottom right, you have compression low angle of attack and tension high angle of attack. And here again, more pictures showing what's going on. A positive high angle of attack, 
positive low angle of attack, and then here you have negative high angles of attack. And again, showing you how this how this maps into the curve below the VN diagram. So high angle of attack, compression on the top, and you can see here that matches this point. And so you can just keep looking at the different quadrants to see where where are you matching this. Another important consideration is gust loads. Uh, gust loads need to be considered. And so gust loads, the net change in angle of attack is felt by the aircraft. And it depends not only on the gust, gust velocity, uh, but also on the aircraft motion induced by the gust as the airplane goes by this gust profile. So say you have this gust profile here uh, and you have a velocity in this manner and the aircraft is transversing that, a gust will never reach its maximum velocity instantaneously. Uh, during the period of buildup, the airplane will have no time to acquire that motion. So therefore, um, you know, and you can see here that if I look at this curve right here, that's the gradient in length, and then that's a change in velocity for that gradient in length. I'm looking at a particular area here of that gust. Uh, and so, very typically, you approximate this gust as a cosine function here, uh, pi s divided by L. So that's your gust velocity. That's how that's approximated using this cosine of this, this, this formula here. And so then you take that and, and the aircraft velocity uh, is this, right? So that's your aircraft velocity. And then this becomes your net velocity causing lift. And so you have to take this kg factor multiplied by UDE to get the net velocity causing the lift. That's typically how that's done. And how you ca calculate that kg, that kg is calculated through these formulas here. For subsonic, less than 0.88, you're going to have a formula that looks like this. Okay. And then for supersonic, you're going to have a form formula that looks like this. Now, mu g is the relative aircraft mass ratio which is defined by an other formula, W divided by S, rho C bar, G A naught divided by two. Now that all this is in my book, is described very carefully. And if all we know is the slope A naught prime, then we can estimate the 3D lift curve slope A naught. And I provide this in my book. Hence for steady state flight, we can define an incremental gust load, gust load factor as follows, the velocity u, okay, equals kg ude. That's what we talked about here, right? That's the ve gust velocity equals ude times this uh, cosine behavior here. And so we're taking kg and multiplying by that. That's what this is. And now I can calculate the incremental load factor due to this gust. And so that's going to be kg times this formula here uh, times v. And we're using the equivalent error speed here. Uh, so yeah, that's how you will do it. And now you can define the gust load factor as one plus minus delta n, and n is come is going to be either one plus delta n or one minus delta n, depending upon what's going on with the gust. So that's how you do this calculation. And so that that will show you that shows you the treatment of gust effects uh, and and how to deal with that. Now, I want to point out that this advisory circular goes into the dynamic gust load factors in a lot more detail. And here is a, from the government website, it shows you the formulas I'm showing you here are consistent to the requirements as written in 23.443 in the Federal Aviation Regulation Standards. And it tells you basically the vertical surfaces must be designed to withstand in an accelerated flight at speed cruising velocity lateral gusts of values prescribed by the cruising velocity. In addition for commuter, commuter category airplanes, the airplanes assume to encounter derived gusts normal to the plane of symmetry, while an acceler on accelerated flight, and then it tells you V, B, V, C, V, D, and V, F, those are the points in that VN diagram that we talked about, that the derived gusts and airplane speeds corresponding to these conditions are to be determined based on these articles here. 
and must be investigated. The shape of the gust must be specified and is going to use the cosine function I talked about. In the absence of a more rational analysis, the gust must be computed as this. And so that's, that's, that's the gust load that you have to consider. And that's the load on the vertical surface. And then now you have this calculation that matches exactly what I showed you earlier. And the mu is the lateral mass ratio I showed you earlier as well. And all these parameters will match exactly what I just showed you. And you can see the impacts of gust is going to change your is going to change the VN diagram, the shape of it. Uh, and so when you're designing an aircraft, you want to design for an envelope that envelopes both the gust line load and in envelopes the no gust load. So whatever how the what, however the VN diagram looks more expanded, whether by the gust line or the maneuver, you want to have that envelope fully taken care of. And that's what this is talking about here. That's a formula I just told you about that's in my book and is in the Federal Aviation Regulations. It gives you additional information here about this. The 737 you can see here has a dive speed uh, and then you have your uh, cruising speed and then you can see that's corresponds to Mach 0.82, this is Mach 0.89, and again, very similar. And then you have your 37,000 feet flaps up ceiling. So this is not your VN diagram, but shows you the altitude as a function of airspeed, equivalent airspeed for 737. And my point here is to show you that difference between dive speed and cruising um, speed. And you can see here that as I go higher in altitude, then these values change because I'm going, I'm calculating according to this equivalent air speed. That's why that's happening. The air is, is lighter as you go higher up. So it's less dense. And so then your equivalent velocity decreases because of that. Again, I'm doing everything in reference to the, to the sea level. So what are the loads in an aircraft? You have the air loan deflection, that's one type. Uh, you apply air loan deflection, you get a roll. And then you have the inertia and the load factor here. So you can construct with the lift applied, you can construct a free body diagram that basically tells you what is the distribution of the lift or and the load shear and bending across this wing. Then you have loads in an aircraft that are, that are caused by this, this yawing of the rudder. So if I put a, a, a rudder deflection, the, you're going to have a, an amount of deflection, uh, the aircraft is going to um, have a side slip. And so you can then construct a free body diagram to account for uh, a side slip condition. Loads in the aircraft, they're going to uh, entail thermal loads, mountain induced, wind shears, jet stream. These are very, uh, these are loads that are going to impart additional loading into your aircraft. Lifting force typically is going to have a distribution like that. That's your wing. And now that you have this lifting distribution, you can do cuts to figure out if you treat this wing as a beam, you can then do cuts to figure out the bending moment and the shear diagram, and then use that to size your design. I'll come into that a little bit later. During a turn, so you say you're taking a turn, uh, rolling will occur due to the application of the roll control devices. An unbalanced moment about the aircraft has to be reacted by the inertial forces. You can see that here. And so here's a load due to the air line deflection. Uh, you expect it to roll to the right, and then this inertia is counterbalancing that. The effect of wing torsional deflections on the rolling effectiveness of the aerons and spoilers have to be accounted. You have to account for that. But again, you can now, the required cases here is N equals zero, and N equals two over three, two times 2.5 G maneuvering loads. That gives you a 1.67 G. So these are required cases to be analyzed. You also have the tail down landing where you get a tail strike here. And so you get a lot of loading here and that needs to be looked at and analyzed. You can see here, I have the weight. Uh, I have N times W, you have the inertia loads. And then you have the loading at the wheel because you're going to hit the wheel as well, as well and then the drag in this direction. And you can again draw a free body diagram to study this. 
you have the two point landing. I promise I'll touch on that. The two point landings at the back end of the aircraft, the wheels are touching this, the, 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 the ground. So you have the normal load here is a reaction. This V is not a velocity, it's a reaction force. And then you have here the, drag, the, the frictional forces. This is your thrust because you're moving forward. That's a weight. And then you have N times W. Again, three point landing again. And here the lift got inverted because you're pushing the aircraft downwards against the ground. And you can see here that uh, for a three point landing, now I have some sort of forces in the front wheel. You could also have a single wheel landing. That's going to cause you to do a lot more work in terms of, you know, the loading is going to be such that um, you're going to have to draw a free body diagram again. So see here you have a single wheel condition. Here in the single wheel condition, you have a huge amount of shear across these uh, two loads. And the airplane, the inertial loads is going to cause it to be in equilibrium. Without that, the whole aircraft will crash. So inertia loads, Newton's law is really helping us keep this aircraft in check. Uh, and you can see here, those inertial forces are going to balance a single wheel load. You also have loads in aircraft due to lateral drift. So say you have some amount of lateral drift, then you have to then calculate the, uh, the behavior uh, for that condition. And so you can see if I have a lateral drift, then I have 0.8 here, 0.6 here. So you get a, a total reaction of 1.4 and you still have some inertia that has to balance that somehow. And then you have th this weight is getting balanced as well. And the wheels will then also have some amount of, it's gonna have a reaction force in the front wheels here and the back wheels as well. And these are the general analyses that you will perform. It, all of this is, can be done with free body diagram. And here you have a takeoff situation, some amount of loading here, some amount of loading here, and then 2.0 times the weight here. Brake roll is going to have, you have to look at brake roll as well. And from brake roll, you also get um, an amount of loading on the wheels that need to be considered for the main gear only and the main and nose gear as well. So this, the design loading that needs to be accounted for in the analysis. And then here you have towing. So I'm pulling now the aircraft. The weight is 1.0. So that stays the same. And then you, you, you just basically have an applied tow lift at the axle of the, the nose gear. And you also have a force here and a frictional force there. Reverse towing, again, that's different from this one. This is pulling and this is reverse towing, which can also occur. The fuselage has to be analyzed for a number of conditions that I already covered, but I'll repeat them. General internal pressure, external pressure, dynamic landing, brake roll, ground turn, taxing, symmetrical braking, vertical gust, spin lateral gust, and so forth. The engine mount also has to be analyzed. You need to analyze for yawing gyroscopic behavior, pitching gyroscopic behavior, landing impact, 3.0 load factors on the engine thrust, 3.0 load factors on reverse thrust, 9.0 times load factors forward on engine weight, and then roll side loads of two and a half load factors on the engine weight. And then you have to combine the thrust with vertical and side loads. So there's a lot of load cases that have to be looked at for the engine mount, is my bottom line. And the wing has a number of load cases that have to be looked at. Uh, fuel slosh, fuel vapor, unsymmetric span-wise lift distribution. Control surface reversal, maneuver with certain wing fuel tanks empty, flaps down for takeoff and flaps down for landing, negative low angle of attack, positive low, ang low, low angle of attack, negative high angle of attack, positive high angle of attack, taxi, jacking and flutter. All these needs to be accounted for the wing. And so how you go about this? It's a very simple analysis. It goes back to beam theory. You plot the weights for everything. And then you do section cuts to figure out what the distribution is going to be of shear and bending moment. That's all you have to do. Given these loads, 
you should be able to tell me what the distribution of shear and bending is across this vehicle by doing section cuts. And you're going to have a, a lift here on this surface. You're going to have a lift on this surface, so on the wing, of course. So you have to do section cuts until you figure out what the shear and bending moment diagram are. Here is an example of idealizing the aircraft as a beam, courtesy of Vought Industries. And you can see I have pressure inside. I have the drag, I have weight, I have tail down force, I have the weight of the engines, the weight of the fuselage, the lift. So this in the flight configuration, I can still do a cut and figure out the axial shear and bending is at every single cut based on that information. And if I idealize the aircraft as a beam and I were to plot it, uh, the, it's going to look something like this, right? You, you can do the calculation at home with a real problem. So for internal loads, what you're going to do is once you have the internal loads, you have the shear and the bending, you're going to start studying how that's going to translate into the fuselage skin and the laundry run. So uh, the bending moment is carried based on the MC over I. You've seen that formula before. Stress equals MC over I. That's exactly how that's gonna, that cross-section is going to behave. And here you can see the different, different stiffeners. Um, and you can see how the bending is going to get distributed uh, here at the bottom left. Crown laundry runs and skin carry tension loads due to the bending moment. So these are going to carry the, the, the tension loads. The skins also carry the shear load, VQ over I. You've seen this in mechanics of materials. Uh, and the lower laundry runs will see compression due to the bending moment in the way we plotted it. You can see there's compression here, tension there. So that makes sense. And you will then basically plot that as a functional location and simultaneously calculate the shear on the panels, on the skin, and then the axial or compression loading on, the, on, on each of the laundry runs. For the wing, you can also idealize that as a wing. Uh, and if you idealize that, that as a wing, you can calculate the distributed pressure. You can calculate the moment and the shear if I do cuts. And you can even calculate the torsion. Uh, and that's going to help you figure out. Uh, you can size now the wing cross section, uh, knowing that any, any stiffening elements going along the wing takes the tension and compression load and the skin will take the shear. Here's a very quick example. Uh, I have a total wing force uh, of 40,000 pounds, and I have a 6G of loading condition uh, times one and a half for factor six. That's 360,000 pounds. So that 360,000 pounds has to be divided because I have two wings, one here and one here. And then each fuselage must resist half of that load. So that's 180, like I said. 180. And the moment then becomes P half. Uh, so I apply that the center of area of this uh, distributed load, and it's going to be about here. So P half times Y minus R times 25. So that's how you will do the calculation. R here uh, is this reaction force here. So you can calculate it as 180 times that minus 180 times 25, and you get the moment at this base of the fuselage. And so, so yeah, so that's, that's what I was talking about. This is basically your fuselage here, OK? And I should have covered the problem statement first and gone to the solution next. So let me cover the problem statement again. You have a continuous wing, and you assume that all the weight and inertia is supported at the wing elastic axis. The elliptical distribution is 40,000 pounds, a load factor of 6 Gs. Determine the ultimate bending moment, and you support everything at the fuselage points. We support it here and here, and that's 25 inches. So I apologize for kind of skipping on that. But now that you know that it's 40 times 6, that makes more sense. 40 times 6 times 1.5 for factor of safety, since it's ultimate 360,000 pounds, and that's 360. So half of that here, 180. So it has to get reacted here, 180. So now you can just calculate the moment at, at the base, which is what is being asked for here. So that, that's how you'll approach it. And so, so top level view, 
you have the wind tunnel data that gives you the pressure distribution, gives you the lift coefficients, the drag coefficients for various angles of attack, which is going to depend on the wing geometry as well, quite significantly. Then you have, you're going to have stability control data, and all that information with the mass will give you the external load information. Once you have the external load, loads, you have to do balance of forces, doing free body diagrams to calculate internal loads. And once you know the internal loads, you can calculate the stress, like stress equals MC over I, for example. Once I have that, I go into post-processing, and now I can size it, and then I can determine whether I'm in good shape. If I have a problem, I have to resize the structure and go back and forth until everything is, is, is settled. So this covers kind of the theory of the external loads, and then I'll step into more of the nitty-gritty analysis in the next lecture. Thank you very much, and have a good day.